So, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, let's continue our meeting. We now come to the first item on the agenda this morning, and it is an exchange of views with Minister Pekka Havisto following his trip to Ethiopia and Sudan as Special European Envoy. This is a joint exchange of views with the Committee on Development, so I'd also like to welcome colleagues from DEVE, especially Chairman Thomas Tobé. Minister Havisto, dear Pekka, it is a real pleasure to welcome you to our joint committee meeting. Thank you so much for taking your time to join us and to share the insights from your missions to Ethiopia and to Sudan. The Committee on Development and the Committee on Foreign Affairs are following the situation in the region very closely. We are, of course, particularly concerned about the situation in Tigray. We have held a series of exchange of views since the beginning of the conflict between the Ethiopian government and the Tigray People's Liberation Front, amongst others, as well as with the ambassador of Ethiopia to the EU, to whom we have conveyed our concerns. This conflict has caused untold death, destruction to civilian infrastructure, and has now forced two million people to flee the region. During your mission, dear Pekka, you emphasized the EU's priorities for the region, the withdrawal of Eritrean troops, civilian access to humanitarian aid, dialogue between Tigray and Addis, and the laying down of arms. Sadly, this seems a distant prospect even after eight months of conflict. Minister Havisto, we are eager to hear your impression of events on the ground and your assessment of the situation. But before I give you the floor, let me invite my colleague, Thomas Tobé, Chair of the Committee on Development, to present his introductory remarks. Thomas. Thomas Tobé is obviously not connected or we have technical difficulties. Well, then I can immediately hand over to Pekka Havisto. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, David. And, and uh, good to see you again. And uh, thank you for this uh, nice and kind invitation from your side to talk with your committee on, on, on the recent developments in uh, Tigray and, and, and the whole of Ethiopia. And uh, I was first mandated in early 21 by uh, His Excellency High Representative Borrell to travel uh, first to, to Ethiopia's fact-finding mission. That time I did not visit Tigray, but had an opportunity to visit Sudan and also the Umra Kuba camp uh, on the border of uh, Ethiopia and Sudan. And of course, in the camp of Umra Kuba, already see the misery of uh, people who have been fleeing from Tigray. And it was particularly clear that in that Umra Kuba camp already in February, there were more than 20,000 uh, refugees. And the uh, refugee workers said that people who are fleeing from Tigray are even in a worse condition than earlier. There are unoccupied uh, children coming. There are people who have been suffering malnutrition and, and so forth. And this was the situation in, uh, in February. Uh, I had uh, then opportunity uh, to, to meet uh, Prime Minister Abi. I had opportunity to, to talk to uh, Foreign Minister Mekonen and, and others, other ministers in um, uh, Addis Abeba, and it was very clear actually that uh, on, in February there was still this kind of uh, atmosphere of denial uh, ongoing in, in uh, uh, Ethiopia. They even denied, of course, they denied the human rights violations, they denied the refugee crisis, and they denied the Eritrea participation, which was, of course, a uh, little bit shocking for us because we had already several witnesses and the humanitarian organization on the ground who have been witnessing the, the Eritrean uh, presence. 
uh, actually uh, from my first trip in February, there were three key messages by European Union to deliver to Ethiopian government. First was unhindered humanitarian access. Second was the independent human rights investigation. And third was the immediate withdrawal of Eritrean troops. This was the position of us in, in uh, already in February. And uh, unhi on unhindered humanitarian access, some progress has happened, some uh, e more easy visa rules for humanitarian workers, some access has been facilitated, but definitely it's not unhindered situation yet. The second independent human rights investigation uh, Ethiopia government allowed their own national uh, human rights organization and uh, Madame Basle, the, the UN human rights organization, to, to start to work together to, to make an uh, assessment. The, the results has not yet, be, yet been published, but of course we wait those results uh, any day. And on immediate withdrawal of Eritrean troops, absolutely no progress. Then my uh, second trip to the region was in April. I actually visited also the uh, Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, Arab Emirates, and then again uh, Ethiopia. And it was clear that in, in uh, April uh, they in Ethiopia had to face the, the situation like it is. Uh, we, we talked about the things with their own names, the presence of Eritreans and, and, and so forth. And we, of course, uh, in addition to those uh, uh, key messages that we had in uh, February, had an uh, immediate uh, ceasefire request and also immediate starting of the talks with the uh, uh, Tigray uh, opposition, starting a national dialogue. And of course, in addition to that, we, we raised issues on the GERD, the Renaissance Dam, issue and the al fasaka Triangle issue, which seems still to be a hotspot of the area. Uh, none of these issues, not the national dialogue or, or uh, ceasefire, has been so far uh, implemented by the Ethiopian government. And as you know, they are in the, now in the middle of uh, so-called election process. They have postponed the elections and, and uh, in the end of uh, June should be the first round, and I understand that then in, in uh, autumn the next ones. In addition uh, to these key messages, I had the opportunity then to visit again with the mandate of Jose Borrell, uh, Tigray, uh, Mekele. We saw the uh, hospital there. We heard the stories about all the closed hospitals and, and destroyed hospitals and, and health stations. We had an opportunity to meet uh, humanitarian organization and, and here the eyewitnesses we met with the women who have been victims of uh, sexual violence and, and harassment uh, very very serious uh, crimes so it's it's very obvious that when these human rights uh, reports are, are coming it will be a very dark picture on on the cry what is the situation now uh, particularly from the western Tigray people have fled as said uh, and uh, estimation between one or two million IDPs, many of them now in, in Mekele. We met them in uh, schools that they are occupying now as uh, temporary IDP centers. At the same time, of course, the authorities said they have no place for these uh, people, no, no possibility to have them permanently there. There are no permanent refugee camps. And at the same time, the, the government of uh, Ethiopia is talking about uh, uh, returning of these people to Western Tigray, but not any credible plan of doing that. And of course, if you send farmers back to locations where their equipment and, and uh, houses are destroyed, it's, it's another catastrophe. What we are facing now is, is very likely the even increased humanitarian catastrophe in the form of malnutrition, UN. Uh, OCHA has been warning about that. People have not been uh, able to to cultivate uh, in in the now in the, during the during the agricultural season and, and so forth. So we have uh, additional problems coming for the clients. Maybe then finally, uh, David, if I say a word about uh, uh, Eritrea, you might know that I have been throughout the years been keeping quite regular contacts to to Eritrea, trying to find a way how to get uh, 
Eritrea out of this current isolation where they are, and I have been maintained uh, almost weekly contact to, to Asmara, to President Afeverki, uh, uh, Isaias Afeverki's advisors to understand the, the Eritrean dynamics. And in the beginning, of course, they were uh, binding their fate very much to the fate of uh, Prime Minister Abi and the success of Abi's project in, in Ethiopia. Now, of course, um, it, it is obvious that they start to look the situation also from their national security perspective in the case that uh, uh, some changes are happening on the, on the political line or leadership in Ethiopia in the, in the future. And I think this should be the time when we could fix the border between Ethiopia and, and Eritrea according to the Algiers uh, agreement. And I think it's very important message also to Eritrea that in the future their national security would be guaranteed. But at the same time, of course, they have to be responsible for all the atrocities that's happened, that has happened in, in, in Tigray. And, and we have to increase uh, our political pressure to uh, Eritrea to uh, force them to withdraw from Tigray because no negotiations between the Tigrayans and the government of Ethiopia will, will happen until uh, Eritrean troops have left the country. So this is more or less my, my uh, short introduction and I'm happy to hear your comments and, and answer possible questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Foreign uh, Minister, Minister uh, Havisto, uh, for your introduction. We will now open up the floor uh, and I will start by giving the floor to our chair of the standing delegation, Carlos Sorin, USND. Okay, Mr. Srinu is not uh, connected, uh, then we might come back to him. I will then give the floor to our AFET standing rapporteur, Fabio Castaldo. Not connected, then we go back and we go to, uh, then I give the floor to Paolo Ranchel, AFET EPP. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Cher, or both shares. Uh, first, I also naturally would like to uh, thank on behalf of EPP, uh, Minister, uh, Foreign Minister of Finland, uh, for his work, for his commitment that was quite clear in this intervention to overcome this very challenging situation and to work for peace, for stability, reconciliation. Our group, EPP, fully supports your mandate and we wish you full success. Uh, the situation in Tigray remains very serious, very concerning. This major humanitarian tragedy needs to be addressed by the European Union and by the international community as a whole. We must prevent famine and further atrocities. Uh, as such as, as the G7 did this past weekend, we call for an immediate cessation of hostilities, unimpeded humanitarian access to all areas and the immediate withdrawal of Eritrean forces. We naturally also welcome the work of the Office of the United Nations of Human Rights. It is clear that this conflict can only be solved politically. And naturally, the solution has to be based on reconciliation and in social dialogue. Obviously, the conflict uh, is built on a fragile social and economic ground uh, uh, in both Ethiopia and also Sudan, uh, which has just uh, recently uh, overcome decades of this devastating and brutal regime of Omar al-Bashir. The situation is further complicated by the disputes over water access and the very well-documented disagreement over the dam in Ethiopia. As such, we must make sure that this situation does not have a further negative impact on the wider region as a whole which is already troubled by too many conflicts and challenges. I would say that 
in this complicated environment, dear foreign minister, it is uh, very good to have you in this position. We reiterate our call for a credible political process and our full support to your mission and your efforts. And of course, we reiterate the conclusion by the G7 this weekend, the joint call opens Ethiopia's leaders to advance a broader, inclusive political process to foster, to foster a national reconciliation and a consensus towards a future based on respect for the human and political rights of all people in Ethiopia. So I wish you also all the luck because we are very, very aware that this is a very sensitive, difficult and delicate task, but you know that you have our trust. Thank you. And then give the floor to our chair of the standing delegation, Carlos Sorin, USND, please. Thank you very much, President. So, sorry for, for the delay, some confusion perhaps in the, in the calendar. Uh, thank you also to Mr. Avisto for coming to Parliament to inform us uh, of your mission and for uh, your presentation and the insights. Uh, we support, of course, the, the key demands of the European Union, most importantly to cease hostilities, to provide access for humanitarian ac uh, access and to put an end to the horrible human rights abuse and to investigate those that have been committed. The situation in Ethiopia is extremely worrying and taking into account what it is at stake, it simply cannot get enough uh, attention. Even without the Tigray conflict, it is, it is clear that the Ethiopian uh, transition is very fragile. In addition, with the current conflict in Tigray and the mounting tensions among the different groups in Ethiopia, there are real risks of the long-term unity of Ethiopia and as a multi-ethnic country. Ethiopia is going into, into elections in June with important parts of the opposition boycotting it. And in some areas, the security situation being bad or volatile even outside Tigray. So, in addition, COVID-19 is not under control and the rate of infections is currently higher than it was when the elections were initially postponed last year. So, there are tensions with Sudan and Egypt. The Ethiopian Prime Minister would like to forge a closer alliance with Eritrea and Somalia two countries that are themselves facing a new uncertain future in terms of their governance. While the government had said that the military operations were only targeting the TPLF and not Tigrayans, there are not many Tigrayans left in any public service job, so it seems the past grievances are giving away to revenge and new grievances. So, Minister, after your visit in February, you said that uh, many of your holders in Isabela seem to be in a state of denial, and as to the gravity of the situations. So I wonder then else can be done so that the Prime Minister and those around him recognize the immense risks they are running and how they can be make to understand that they need to make a transition inclusive, which also means coming to terms with those who held the power in the past in ways other than obliterating them. Otherwise, things can still get worse. Finally, if time permits, I would like to ask if, or of the external action service Let's speak a bit more about the whole of other actors in the region and what their perception and engagement is or may be. At last but not least, how we coordinate with the United States, which under the new administration has recognized the urgency and importance of what is happening and will appoint a special envoy to the Horn of Africa. Thank you, Mr. President, for the opportunity to, play, uh, to speak now. Thank you, Maria Arena, Afet, SND. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we will have the opportunity to discuss Ethiopia this morning and also this afternoon in the strategic AFET dialogue on the role of Europe. And it's important for us to have the information on the situation in Ethiopia today. Of course, there are two things which are very important. The, the situation in Tigray and humanitarian situation for the Ethiopian populations were being deprived of a lot of rights. That is the right to food and health, as well as the right to freedom of expression. But I wanted to put a question about the other communities. We know that Ethiopia is made up of two main communities, 
accounting for 30, uh, 32% or the almost nama. We know about the fact that Tigre accounts for 4%. But how is this fifth federal system, which should represent all the people of uh, Ethiopia, is going to guarantee, how is it going to guarantee rights for every Ethiopian, because as there's violence in Tigray, we've got to be very mindful as to what's going to happen to the other communities in Ethiopia and guarantee freedom of expression and freedom of getting organized and being representative in the political array of Ethiopia. The second lay outside partners, uh, especially with respect to uh, reprisals that take place in Tigray with the support of it, uh, Eritrea and their dictatorship, but there's also the Baha'is, where there's a conflict between Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia on how water should be distributed. Now, that's something that could make things very difficult in that region. So how can we actually analyze this situation in a much calm, uh, a much calmer way? How can we renegotiate the water a distribution contract in the Nile should we be based on the past which guaranteed 80% of the Nile waters to Egypt or could we actually discuss uh, the filling of the dam which would not uh, endanger the populations of other countries and could we have a more scientific way of using waters which might help us as Europeans to play the role of mediators in this water conflict which really could be dramatic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Javier Nort, uh, Afet, Renew. Uh, gracias. Thank you. El conflict. Well, the Tigray conflict has been brought on by the par loss of Tigray's power in the government uh, by the Romaras and Homuno who's been supported by the Amaras. That's the whole reality. It's not an artificial conflict. It's a political rival type conflict. And Tigris has all, Tigre has always been kind of the uh, apple of discord between the Etria and Maris. There are se several questions. How can we reconstruct, not only materially, but morally, Tigray so that they can actually feel that they are part of a complicated community like Ethiopia. Then what impact will the withdrawal of Eritrean and Ethiopian forces from the Somali conflict, which has a certain component to it, but uh, it, it's the presence of a Christian army, uh, which is an imperial army, on uh, uh, in a certain ethnical areas like Somalia, and therefore it's kind of a continuation of the Somalian regime. And how what impact will it have on Egypt in addition to Sudan? We've got the Nile and the Blue Nile. This is an important component which will be uh, affected by the Renaissance brought on by the 1959 agreements on the water distribution in Egypt. And I wonder what impact this is all going to have on all these structural areas. There are these realities based on rivalry. Uh, what do you think of all of this and how it will uh, impact on the situation? For our Afet standing rapporteur, Fabio Castaldo. Thank you very much, Chair, and thanks to Mr. Havisto for being here today with us for exchanging views and takeaways from his visit to Ethiopia and Sudan. The suffering created by the, uh, the breakout of the hostilities in Tigray and the subsequent flows of refugees in Sudan have been discussed several times in this committee, as well as the potential regionalization of the conflict and the possible exacerbation of the latent tensions between Ethiopia and Sudan for the border disputes. Therefore, I would like to underline the fact that we must address the root causes of instability in the region if we want to create the preconditions for sustained peace and stability. Indeed, it appears clear that we w there will be no rooms 
for easing the tensions without a proper solution to the controversies over the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, the, G the GERRD, and to uh, the increasing ethnical clashes within Ethiopia. On the GRD, we came to know that the talks conducted in the Democratic Republic of Congo under African Union guidance have reached a, de a dead end, a fact that represents a constant over the last 10 years. Furthermore, in April, Tunisian President Kai Sayed explicitly declared his support for the Egyptian claims, further increasing the possibility that two opposite poles standing on incompatible positions will emerge in Africa with Tunisia, Egypt and Sudan on one side, and Ethiopia, Eritrea, Eritrea and Somalia on the other side, fracturing the unity of the African Union. The position taken by Tunisia also paved the way for the issue to reach the UN Security Council. Mr. Havisto, do you think that the EU would be able to agree on a common position to be brought forward in UN fora? In your opinion, and according to your recent experience on the ground, what are the main issues on which an enhanced EU involvement in the negotiations and as honest broker between the two sides might be beneficial? Then, on Ethiopia's stability and the resolution of the conflict in Tigray, I have seen that in an interview with Arab News soon after your trip to Addis Ababa, you have mentioned the need for the EU to cooperate with Saudi Arabia deeply. Could you please elaborate further on the, on the way you foresee to establish such a cooperation, and how could it, it be possible to cooperate with a country we have strongly criticized over the years for failing to respect human rights in a situation such as the one in Tigray? Lastly, I would like to hear your considerations on the humanitarian situation in Ethiopia and the alleged famine that is striking the Tigray region. According to UN reports, more than three, uh, 350,000 people are currently living in starvation, and yesterday the G7 leaders called for unconditioned access for, of aid workers and uh, food supplies. Although this news is more recent than, than your trip to Addis Ababa, the worrying conditions in which people are living were reported also at the time of your trip. Therefore, I would like to know whether the Ethiopian government has made any promise to solve this humanitarian crisis, and if you discussed ways ahead that could entail a stronger role for the EU, maybe also through a reinforcement of, of of UNF for Somalia in the case the WFO shipment will be increased in number and frequency. The humanitarian crisis also affects the refugees who fled to Sudan in early phases of the war in Tigray. Can you tell us more about any potential negotiations between Addis Ababa and Khartoum that could allow refugees to return safely to Ethiopia? Thank you very much for all the details you will, you will share with us and for, uh, for all your kind answers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if we have someone from the Greens connected. Ms. Alamatsa, is she connected? Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Havisto, for being here with us today. And my colleague Reinhard Butikofer could not make it, but I took his part uh, for, for uh, this brief moment to thank you for your excellent work on this matter. And uh, we are very grateful for, for all that you do for the peace in the region. What I would like to ask is that uh, what is the main obstacle in your analysis uh, to peace and also UN involvement in the region and in, in this process at this point? And secondly, what is uh, the concrete thing that EU and we can do right now to ease the humanitarian crisis that we have in the area? Thank you once again so much and thank you all for such great discussion on this topic and I hope we will find a lot of answers today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Asita Kanko, Afet is your... Not connected, then we we'll go to Janina Shoska, uh, Deve, EPP. <laughs> Ms. Ochovska, you have the floor. Okay, we might come back to Janina then. We go to Norbert Neusser, Deve, SND.
Vielen Dank für die Arbeit, die Sie. Thank you for the work that you do in Ethiopia and Sudan. We kleine Fortschritte im Bereich der humanitären Hilfe, aber immer noch kein Zugang für alle humanitären Organisationen. The connection. Uh, interpreter apologizes, but this Fortschritt und äh, Sie haben auch über die wichtige Rückkehr von Menschen nach Westtigray, aus Westtigray gesprochen. Äh, ich denke, das ist sehr wichtig, denn äh, wir stehen vor der nächsten humanitären Katastrophe, weil ähm, viele Felder durch den Konflikt nicht bestellt werden konnten. Ähm, ich will mich konzentrieren auf humanitäre Hilfe. Welche Überlegungen äh, sind angestellt, damit diese humanitäre Krise besser gelöst werden kann, auch im Hinblick darauf, dass die Hungersnot sich noch erweitern kann. Und äh, wie sehen Sie die Möglichkeiten, die extremen Spannungen zwischen den Ethnien äh, innerhalb von Äthiopien gemeinsam mit der Zentralregierung äh, zu, be zu befrieden? Weil äh, man hat schon den Eindruck, dass... Äh, The sound quality isn't adequate for interpretation purposes. No, the connection is too poor for translation. Sorry. That's... Yeah. I'm sorry, Norbert, you have the floor again. Uh, I didn't have any translation. Uh, I think I heard you uh, well enough. The connection was too bad for translating. Seemed to be the case. We we'll give the floor to Norbert Neusser again, of course, so we can do his closing. The connection quality was not adequate for interpretation purposes. Mr. Neuser, you have the floor. I would ask you to please remove your headphones. Okay. So I just, I continue in English. I just want to add uh, what are the plans from uh, the, um, from our Minister Harvisto to uh, solve these humanitarian problems because they are getting stronger because uh, in agriculture, there was not really work to be uh, done. And the second one is how to continue to work together with the government in uh, Addis Abeba to calm down the ethnic conflict because it's ongoing and ongoing. And we have a similar situation like it was in former Yugoslavia that the whole country is uh, going down. Thank you. Thank you, Norbert, and thank you for being so flexible. Uh, we move on then to the next one, and I give the floor to Mick Wallace from the left. Thanks very much, Chair, and, and thanks to uh, Mr. Havistov for his, uh, his contribution. Uh, do you agree at this stage that there's, there's a recognition that war crimes have taken place and that Abiy Ahmad and Afarki are clearly guilty of war crimes? And do you really think this is going to be an independent investigation? Will these two individuals be tried for war crimes? Surely, unless this happens, it makes a mockery, a mockery of international law. Secondly, you talk about the so-called election process, and I agree with you, it is a so-called election process. Surely, the EU isn't going to recognize these elections, given that it can be pretty selective about what rec elections it recognizes across the world. But uh, recognising these at the moment with many of, of Abiy Ahmed's opponents in prison makes uh, it's just a joke. Thirdly, who is supplying Abiy Ahmed still with arms? He isn't making them himself. Somebody is giving them to him. Can we find that out? There is definitely countries continuing to give him arms to carry out war crimes. And lastly, he has support from world powers whether we like it or not, but the US, Russia, China are all still prepared to do business with him. 
because they all want a piece of the action in the Horn of Africa. So why? Why are we allowing this to happen? Abiy Ahmad would not be in power if he did not have support from world powers. We don't, we're not looking for an intervention, but these people, Abiy Ahmad should not get support from outside countries, or al for, for that matter. And giving them support is helping them and supporting their war crimes. And that's the truth of it. Thank you. Thank you. Then I give the floor to Jan Christoph Ochen. Uh, Deve, renew. Thank you, co-chairs. Um, first of all, I want to uh, thank Mr. Havistov uh, as well for uh, reporting back uh, about his mission, and I'm uh, wishing him uh, good luck and uh, success uh, in uh, uh, this uh, delicate uh, affair. Uh, I want to um, uh, ask him about uh, the, the, the next steps he foresees or uh, he, uh, um, uh, he would like to do uh, in uh, this, uh, this, the different uh, situations. First, uh, concerning uh, refugees, we already heard um, uh, that uh, there might that we need a cooperation with uh, Khartoum uh, and uh, the other capitals as well in order to uh, have a safe return of uh, refugees into the Tigray region. Um, uh, what do you, does he think about the situation and uh, what does he foresee as uh, next steps um, uh, concerning this, uh, uh, this issue? Uh, concerning uh, the Nile waters, my colleague Javier Nat uh, already um, uh, highlighted the historical situation since 1959, and I want to reiterate the question of uh, uh, Maria Arena. Uh, so, uh, what can the European Union do uh, in order to, um, from, a, from an outside perspective, as a mediator, um, uh, help uh, that uh, this uh, situation does not uh, escalate? Um, but for me, most important is uh, the situation for the people uh, in Tigray. And uh, uh, we have uh, a lot of reports uh, about malnutrition and, uh, uh, and about um, a famine that is, uh, that is coming up. So uh, I want to ask Mr. Havisto if he's in contact with the um, humanitarian aid organizations and what is his assessment uh, on the situation concerning malnutrition, um, uh, concerning the excess for uh, humanitarian organizations and what can we do, can he do, uh, in order to, um, uh, to open this corridor for humanitarian organizations in order to provide help uh, for the people. And lastly, concerning the elections, um, I mean, we have an oppression of the opposition in, uh, um, in Ethiopia and uh, so you cannot talk about uh, uh, real elections. Um, uh, and I agree that, uh, uh, you said the retreat of the Eritrean troops uh, from Tigray is, uh, is a key priority and is, uh, uh, is uh, the base uh, for um, creating new uh, stability and new, um, let's say, communication uh, or discussion with the Tigrayans. Uh, but how do you assess this uh, situation? Will not the, the, those elections um, bring uh, even more tensions into the country? Thank you. Thank you, Beata Kempe, Deve, ICR. Not connected, and then uh, I wonder if Janina Oshoska uh, is connected. Okay, Janina, you have the floor. Uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> and uh, um, I'm sorry, I am looking for. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Dziękuję panu Pekka Havisto za ciekawą propozycję. I would like to thank the for the very interesting proposal, the uh, or the uh, presentation, the humanitarian situation is very interesting uh, because 
it obviously affects stability in the region. Before the conflict in Ethiopia, there were 12.5 million people there who required humanitarian aid, 2 million in Tigray alone. Now, the situation is far worse. 2.5 million people have no access to water, to basic uh, supplies, to food, and the humanitarian uh, aid workers are... Uh, 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 there's little they can do since the crisis began. The, huma the EU uh, wanted humanitarian corridors to be opened, uh, to be operated by uh, NGOs. I uh, wanted to ask the minister, do you know whether anything has changed in that regard? The regard I'd like to know more about the dramatic uh, shortage of water in the border region, there is a major dam being built on the Nile and a power plant is meant to be built there, but in, uh, it's meant to provide uh, access to water and electricity for people in Ethiopia, but 85% of the Nile water comes from the Ethiopian highlands and the uh, Blue Nile. So uh, the dam would be a major step forward for development in Ethiopia, uh, but would uh, compromise situation in Sudan and perhaps lead to uh, conflict. The uh, Sudanese government believes that it will perhaps have advantages and benefits, but that nonetheless the dam in Sudan won't be as efficient if there no longer is enough water in the Nile. Do you have any additional information on this? Are the countries working together in relation to the water sources? Does the uh, EU provide uh, funds or considering providing funds for water development in both countries. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues from Afid and Deva for your contributions and interesting questions and remarks. And now, Pekka, I give the floor back to you to respond to what you have heard from colleagues, please. Well, thank you and, and, and very good and interesting interventions by, by members of uh, parliament, members of committee, and, and very good questions. And I try to cover uh, <clears throat> those that I, I'm, uh, I'm able to to cover. First, Mr. Rang Rangel and, and uh, several uh, members of parliament asked actually about the regional dynamics. And, and if I'm if I'm looking first on the on the uh, side of the dam, the Millennium Renaissance Dam that many of you uh, mentioned, it is clear that it's, it will be a major uh, factor for the, particularly for the production of electricity in, uh, in Ethiopia. And it's, uh, it's this kind of symbol of national proudness. It actually has, has been built from the money of pockets of the ordinary citizens. There has been a collection of, of money from the ordinary citizens in Ethiopia for this huge project. So it's, it's a national proudness issue and, and, and uh, it, it is uh, clearly stated also uh, openly by the government there. And then the problem uh, occurs, as you rightly said, when we speak about the water situation in Sudan and in Egypt. Sudan and Egypt has, have a little bit different interest on this dam issue actually for Sudan uh, the, the Renaissance Dam is not threatening uh, th their uh, water access to water or infrastructure so much, but they are they would like to know how this dam will be managed in the way that there are no flooding or any uh, amount of the water that could destroy the the, uh, the the dams on the Sudanese side. This is very important open exchange of information, and then on Egypt, Egypt more speaks about the water shortage if, uh, if if the dam will be built well will there be enough water on the on the down river of nile and now in these circumstances where uh, uh, ethiopia is not negotiating not with sudan and not with egypt egypt and, and sudan has joined their forces and and, and try to pressure uh, ethiopia and, and and these talks are ongoing 
and it's it's uh, the European Union and actually US. We have a very key role in these talks. We are observers in these uh, dam talks, and of course we we uh, we have two kind of messages. First message, of course, to Ethiopia to to come forward with all the technical data, come to the table. Now the second feeling is happening this summer, and it's obvious it will happen because this is the rainy season is coming, and and the neighbors need information. And then the then in the long term they will need to come with uh, with the plan on how the uh, dam when it's ready how it will be operated. And until they are doing that, of course, uh, both Sudan and Egypt will be very suspicious. And as you say, as you can see. Egypt is even using very hostile language, war type of language, uh, uh, increasing its military capacity in the area, but even threatening uh, with the military uh, operations if uh, uh, Ethiopia will not come to the negotiation table. And the European Union has a very, very crucial role in this. This uh, through our EUSR, Alex Rondos, we have been all the time following the, the talks and, and, and been providing data uh, and, and all, all kinds of technical assistance to, to parties in the talk. What the African Union and the, the current uh, chair of African Union, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo DRC can do in, in this, it's, uh, it's, it's not obvious that they have been so successful so far, but it's very, very important that we, we work together with the African Union and, and, and uh, as observers, European Union and US. And, I, I, I know that behind the scenes, these uh, talks and, and contacts are now all the time uh, ongoing. Um, uh, there was also uh, uh, many, many questions about the humanitarian situation, current humanitarian situation on the ground. And, and while it was, has been a little bit improving the access since February, uh, April, the main trouble with the humanitarian organizations is actually to, to safe access to Tigray and some locations in Tigray. They, when they go further, they meet military operations, and these military operations are nobody's informing about those to the humanitarian community. They, 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 the situation is very dangerous for the humanitarian workers when the war is, is ongoing. One day this road is closed, another day another road is closed. They have to turn back from this village, they have to turn back from that village. And for humanitarian community, it's it's very, very difficult situation, a very risky situation that is currently ongoing. So the pressure towards the government has to continue to, to allow the free humanitarian access and, of course, the, the, as to stopping of the uh, hostilities. There was also a question about uh, how this is uh, interlinked to, to the uh, Somalia situation and, and, uh, and, and uh, th this very strange new triangle, which is also challenging the regional cooperation. It's not uh, based now, now no more nowadays so much on IGAD, which has been the traditional regional cooperation organization, but Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Somalia, Mr. Farmaggio, has been working to, together in this kind of triangle, and uh, and it's it's not very friendly triangle to to other countries of the region and, and, and that's the reason why we have also put a lot of pressure of course to Somalia to help the elections to President Farmaggio to, to come back to, to the electoral process and, and luckily this has uh, we have been successful in that so that Prime Minister Robles is now responsible for, for holding the elections in, in uh, Somalia and, and, and this hopefully gives some light to for example to Somalia Kenya connections, which has been very, very bad uh, uh, recently. Um, on the reach, other regional uh, organi countries like the Saudi Arabia and, and Emirates, there was the question also why, why we visited these and, and how, how can we manage cooperating with the, with the countries with whom we have some other pending, pending issues. Uh, we have been actually appealing very strongly both to Saudi Arabia and, and uh, Arab Emirates that they should and could use their influence both to Ethiopia and Eritrea to, to come to the peaceful solution on the Gerd Dam issue and of course the peaceful solution in Tigray. And this dam issue and, and particularly the, the uh, uh, al Fasaka triangle issue are, are issues where the Arab countries can use their influence also by 
by uh, steering their investments and and, uh, and 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 helping the the parties to come to the table and for example arab emirates has been uh, organizing several uh, meetings on the dam issue between the the relevant parties and and we have a uh, excellent exchange of uh, information with these uh, uh, players there was also a question how we cooperate with the U.S. and, and transatlantic cooperation at this stage and, and as rightly mentioned by, by, by members of parliament, the uh, U.S. has appointed a special envoy for the Horn of Africa, very, very experienced diplomat Jeffrey Feldman, who has a long U, UN background and, and now working for the U.S. administration. And we are in contact with uh, Mr. Feldman uh, almost several times per week and, and, and try to coordinate our efforts and, and the reactions both by the European Union and, and, and the US side and, and, and I, I think we have been very successful on that that we have similar messages and, and we share openly information between between us and, and uh, as also mentioned the, the G7 uh, com comments all, all this is very valuable that the international pressure goes to the same direction and I think we work together. There, is also, there was also a question can the human rights assessment be uh, neutral in these circumstances, particularly because part of the human rights assessment is done by, uh, uh, by uh, national human rights organization. That was the precondition of the Ethiopians that the UN uh, High Representative of Human Rights can enter only with the national organization. And of course, you, you, you might ask if, if the national organization could be biased or something like that, but Madame Bachelet has uh, convinced us that she will make her report uh, independently and not be affected by, by the government of Ethiopia or national organizations of Ethiopia. So I trust on that. And, and when there was the question that has some uh, uh, human rights violations or, or war crimes uh, occurred, uh, of course, we have now the many organizations coming with independent reports, but I really recommend to wait for this uh, UN High Commissioner of Human Rights uh, report on, on, on this issue and, and then uh, act accordingly. Of course, this, uh, this issue also should be dealt in the UN uh, Human Rights Council and, 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 and so forth. Uh, for me, particularly, the, the news of the violence against the women is, is uh, incredible and, and something that probably not has happened in, in any wars or conflicts in, in that region. Uh, maybe, maybe a word about what is the aim of uh, Ethiopia. When I uh, met the Ethiopian leadership in February, they, they really used this kind of language that they, they are going to destroy the Tigrayans, they are going to wipe out the Tigrayans for 100 years and, and, and so forth, which, which for me <laughs> referred to to very serious uh, human rights uh, uh, atrocities and crimes as, as well if you wipe out your your uh, national minority what is it it's uh, it, it, you cannot destroy all the people you cannot destroy uh, all the population in in, in Tigray and, and I think that's very obvious that uh, we have to react and and, uh, and because it looks for us like an ethnic cleansing it's a, it is a very very serious uh, uh, act if this is true. Where are the arms coming from? Who is supporting? Uh, of course, we see now the reaction by uh, Prime Minister Abi that when there is an increased pressure from European Union and, and US, he so to say turns to China, he turns to Russia. He there is this kind of uh, hostile language against Westerners now in in Ethiopia, and I also want to warn against this part because if if they really choose this kind of uh, language and rhetoric. This has mean now that our embassies in, in Addis have faced some uh, protests and, you know, people are on the streets, start to be hostile towards the Westerners and so forth. This is not a nice story at, at all. And, and, and this is also what we have to be saying to to government of Ethiopia, that if they want to turn this uh, to some kind of hatred campaign against the Westerners, uh, it doesn't help anyone. It doesn't help any uh, people in the country, but it doesn't help our cooperation uh, either. And, and, and they now want to flag out that they have other friends than West as well. They have China, they have Russia and so forth. And of course, this is a topic that we also should discuss with Russia, with China and, and, and so forth. On um, malnutrition situation and, and what, what uh, 
what will be uh, happening the the news from the ocha are very concerning we have been again on weekly contacts but not only with our own echo but but with icrc with the uh, world food program uh, mr beasley we have uh, talking to ocha we have been talking to uh, unhcr other organizations and i i think the un organizations have a very similar view as us of the situation and ocha has been very very vocal on this uh, possible uh, famine malnutrition that will occur when people cannot uh, do their uh, normal agricultural work and and and, uh, and seeds and, and cannot go back to their houses and, and and homes so this is the situation i i hope i i covered uh, most of the topics uh, of course some questions are still uh, very very open uh, we, we try, of course, in these circumstances when we are working on the Tigray, at the same time try to advance on the, the, the Nile Dam, the Renaissance Dam issue, because it has to be solved also this summer, partly because its second filling is already ongoing and we don't want to go to the situation where there are even military hostilities uh, around the dam in the, in the region. Back to you, Mr. Chairman. Minister Habisur, dear Pekka, thank you for your remarks. I would like to thank you for this interesting exchange of views and the first-hand information we have received from you. The Committee on Foreign Affairs and I guess also the Committee on Development will continue to follow closely the situation in Ethiopia and Sudan and all the neighboring countries. The issues raised today will remain a high priority for our committees. And let me just add one sentence, Pekka. We strongly believe here in the European Parliament in the idea of Team Europe, but we're all in this together on foreign affairs and that the European Parliament is also part of Team Europe. And what we like is that in your case now, the High Representative has tasked you as one of the 27 foreign ministers from a member state to take responsibility as special envoy for the whole EU in dealing with a crisis. I think this is a good role model and I hope that we will see similar uh, projects being realized uh, in this term. So thank you once again, and the final word is with Thomas. Thank you, David, and thank you, Minister Havisto, uh, for uh, not only the role that you have taken on, but also, I would say, for the very interesting uh, debate that we had with the, with the MEPs. Uh, I remember personally, I think it was in October 2000. And 19, I had the opportunity to lead uh, a mission uh, of DEVE MEPs to Ethiopia. And I think I can speak for all of us that we came back from that trip. We felt a lot of hope, I would say, uh, for Ethiopia. But of course, now this is not the first meeting that we're having about the worrying situation in Ethiopia. And I fear that this will not be the last one uh, either. Uh, humanitarian access conditions, yes, have uh, improved if we compare it to the total lack of access that we had between November 2020 and early 2021. But everything, as, uh, as you have pointed out yourself, everything is extremely uh, uncertain and not to our uh, satisfaction. Uh, of course, the most important thing is that we need uh, peace. Uh, the longer these conflicts uh, last, the longer it will take for the reconstruction and the reconciliation of Ethiopia and also the, the wider uh, region. And of course, this is of utmost uh, importance, not only to the people of Ethiopia, but also, I would say, to the European Union. And I think the European Parliament and uh, both the DEVA Committee and AFET Committee, we will continue to follow this closely, uh, and hopefully we will see some uh, progress in the near future. And by that, I think we can end this session. Thank you. Thank you. All the best for our David colleagues and AFIP members. We will continue our meeting at 10.30. So we now have around about 20 minutes break. <laughs>